Hi. So we're going to get started with the next talk. Feel free to eat and um, keep at it. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Jim McGowan. He's a manager for operations analysis and disaster uh, dispatch with the Chicago area Red Cross. I know with the recent events in Oklahoma and in other times of disaster, a lot of us go, you know, I have all these tech skills. I wish there was something more I could do to help during these times. So we invited the um, Chicago area Red Cross to talk about kind of the needs of the Red Cross and how you could help. Uh, I think I could talk long enough without the microphone. You guys can hear me? Yes? No? No. OK. All right. Well, then I'll, I'll go ahead and use the microphone. Um, first of all, uh, Christopher mentioned that I would be speaking while you guys would be eating lunch and that I wouldn't really have much of a captive audience. Uh, but for a lot of us in the Red Cross, we're used to talking to people in their flooded basements and their burnt down homes. And so uh, they're oftentimes more distracted than you guys are now. So this is uh, actually a fairly easy audience uh, for me to, uh, to speak in front of. Uh, what I wanted to do today is talk a little bit about what the Red Cross does, because what we find when we talk to people is that everybody kind of has an idea of what they think they, that we do. Uh, but it may not always be accurate or it may only be a part of, of what we do. Uh, and talk about uh, specifically kind of where we're trying to get to uh, with disaster services uh, here in the, the Chicago region. Uh, but what I'd also like to, uh, to talk about is I think that our problems as a nonprofit are not very different from a lot of nonprofits' problems in how do they manage their information and their data. Uh, and so I think that when you look at kind of some of the struggles that we deal with, uh, lots of other organizations are dealing with these very same problems. Uh, so I think that uh, you can probably identify funded organizations that you may have been associated with in the past uh, that share kind of similar, some of the similar issues that, uh, that we have. Uh, my position, uh, I've had it for about four, uh, four and a half months now. Uh, it's really kind of a two-part position. The first part deals with kind of all the internal operations of the day-to-day -day responses uh, that, uh, that we do. Uh, I think that while people understand that we go to the Superstorm Sandys, we go to the Hurricane Katrinas, we go to the tornadoes in, uh, in Oklahoma, we actually respond to 1,200 disasters a year right here in the Chicago region. Uh, so we are going to probably three or four incidents a day uh, in which we are sending volunteer responders to assist somebody, mostly who have been displaced by house fires, but also storm damage. Uh, they've had their roofs blown off, they've had uh, gas leaks, uh, other serious problems that have displaced them. Uh, and what our volunteers are doing is going out and providing immediate emergency assistance uh, to make sure that people get through those first couple days uh, when they're most vulnerable. So making sure that they have housing, making sure that they have food and clothing, uh, oftentimes people lose uh, medical uh, items, prescriptions, uh, medical equipment, et cetera, and making sure that those things that they need, uh, they, they, they have. Because what we realize is that when people need to start thinking about recovery, there's no way they're going to do it uh, if they're cold or if they're hungry. They're not going to be able to make that transition to start thinking about, okay, so what do I do now uh, after I've uh, after I've been put through disaster? So again, in terms of disaster dispatch, I support a team of about 35 to 40 people, uh, a lot of them volunteers, a growing number of volunteers, who support all of those volunteer responders who go out uh, to our uh, responding disaster general region. Uh, the other half of the job 
is, uh, is, is doing operations analysis for the entire chapter. Uh, there's a lot more than what we do uh, that we do with just disaster. Uh, and so we're finally we have to decide that we actually need to start looking uh, much more holistically at what we do uh, to be able to tell our story better. It's not something that we've done uh, very well in the past, uh, just something that we're starting to identify that we need to be able to do, uh, not only to help us plan our programs, but also to speak to our donors uh, and to other people who are uh, our community, our government partners, to let them know kind of what, what we really do and how we do it. So, all of that said, um, really, those aren't my jobs. My jobs are two things. Number one is to serve our clients, uh, and in any way uh, it's needed. And number two, and equally important, and this fits in with our mission, is to make sure that every volunteer who comes to work with the Red Cross has a meaningful experience. Those are really the two things that I need to be doing uh, in this position. So, uh, and when we look at um, look at our mission statement. Uh, which is uh, to prevent and alleviate human suffering in the face of emergency by mobilizing the power of volunteers and the generosity of donors. It, it, it is about mobilizing volunteers and making sure that they have the tools that they need, making sure that they have the support, and in the end of the day, making sure that, that the services that they provide have brought meaning to them uh, to themselves. One of the things that we have not done in the past is, is, is really uh, really found a way to engage, uh, in particular, the tech community uh, as, as volunteers. Uh, I think in some ways we're kind of afraid of it. Uh, we don't know how to talk to people uh, in, this, uh, in this room. Uh, we don't know what you can do for us. Uh, and so in some respects, we don't, we don't really engage well with you. Uh, and so this is a great opportunity for me to come and talk about kind of what we do. Uh, I, I personally tend to be kind of a generalist. So I can speak a lot of languages, I can speak tech, I can speak social worker, I can speak disaster. I don't do any of them particularly well. I'm not a programmer, uh, but I know what you guys do, and I know what this work is, and I know how meaningful it is. So uh, again, this is an opportunity for us to kind of, uh, to kind of engage what we see as kind of a new group of volunteers, uh, and uh, try to hopefully come up with ways that we can provide meaningful work uh, that, that you guys should do with us. A little bit about uh, our region. Uh, we are a 13 county region uh, in two states. We're made up of four Red Cross chapters. Uh, we serve 9.1 million people. We have 3,000 volunteers who work for us, uh, not only in disaster, but in all of the programs uh, that, that uh, we conduct uh, around the area. Uh, a note about uh, the recent flooding that we had in April, uh, we were able to handle that flooding for about three to three to four days, uh, but even that number of volunteers that we have was not enough to help us do what we needed to do, uh, and we brought in 100 volunteers from out of state and deployed to specifically help us deal with, uh, with the flooding issues uh, that we faced here back in April. So. So we talked a little bit about kind of disaster services, the domestic work that, that we do. Uh, we also do a lot of blood production. So I'm sure many of you have given blood before. You've been to a Red Cross uh, blood drive uh, and given blood. Uh, we provide a huge amount of blood products to, uh, to local hospitals here. Uh, we also have a health and safety program. So maybe either yourself or a brother or sister has uh, been taught how to be a lifeguard for the, for the summer, uh, has taken a preparedness class. We offer thousands of classes all over the, all over the region. We do. Uh, we have support for the uh, military, and that's so much not support directly for the military, but for military families. So, if you had a brother or a sister who was stationed overseas and needed to get in touch uh, with somebody, or you needed to get in touch with them, maybe a grandfather has passed away. Uh, we have Red Cross uh, volunteers and staff on every military base, every military ship uh, that is able to facilitate that communication. Uh, and then we have international services, so we obviously, uh, you'll hear uh, in times of uh, kind of great strike in certain countries, you'll hear about the, uh, um, the International Red Cross. Uh, but we also have uh, programs to uh, help uh, reconnect families uh, after uh, conflict. Oftentimes families are kind of torn apart, uh, and we have a, a tracing service that actually allows people to come back and kind of make those connections. So all of this is great. 
And what we often find is that still we, we're kind of all over the place in what we do. Uh, and so it's very hard to say this is exactly what the Red Cross does. Uh, what I want to focus on today, though, is, is again this disaster. Uh, there, there have been 21 million adults that we've served in the OA in the last uh, 10 years from disaster, which is a five times increase uh, from what we saw uh, before that. And most people that we come across, uh, that, we, that, we teach, that we talk to, that we meet, uh, are not prepared for any type of disaster. Uh, oftentimes people uh, don't have renters insurance. Uh, it's a really simple thing to do, $15 a month to get renters insurance. Uh, there could be a huge, uh, you know, uh, a huge benefit in times of a disaster, uh, but people are not prepared. So we have to make a huge outreach effort to uh, to teach people you know, kind of what's what's available to them uh, in terms of resources. But when it comes to kind of really what we do, I, I'd like to see if I can show a video real quick that uh, that talks about um, that just kind of demonstrates what kind of what the Red Cross does uh, disaster-wise. I don't know if we have the audio hooked up, but according to Chris, I can kind of somehow put this up to the computer and it'll all work swimmingly. Correct? In theory. In theory. Jimmy Cut. So uh, just to, to kind of preface this video, this was actually produced in New York. Uh, you could very easily replace the word for Chicago. It's just we don't have the resources to produce videos like this. But uh, what they do in New York is the same as what we do in Chicago. It's the same thing that they do in Los Angeles and across the United States. I'm very proud of the work that we do happens every day in every community, whether it's a large scale disaster or a single family fire. Water main breaks. Power outages, building collapses, evacuations, from time to time, some man made events, unfortunately. Extreme weather, whether it's heat, snow, winds, coastal flooding. There are 26,000 flies a year, and uh, most of them are residential. So there are thousands of people that are affected by the flies in New York City every year. Any kind of traumatic experience for anyone, regardless of the scale, is going to have a big impact. The most common response, perhaps, is, is the shock. This is a time when uh, our trust in our people and ourselves in the world can be shaken. So that having emotional support, it's really, it turns out to be a critical time. We are looking at the human element of uh, strategy as well as the operational element. But the human element, we need help. And we're the human element. It has to be confident that the victims of an emergency are required to have the interaction with the Red Cross, knowing that there is somewhere that they can rely on for assistance. One of the things that we know as psychologists is this idea that we need to address more basic needs first before you begin to measure out means you need to ensure that you're warm and safe and you have something to eat. People don't usually think of those things as being mental health needs. But how can you deal with it emotionally if you're hungry? I know the very worst is going to be that I don't have to worry about people coming. Are they working? Are they not working? The Red Cross has its own emergency operations center. And you know, I, I think um, technology has allowed people to respond more quickly. I found that the Red Cross is extremely timely in their arrival at any major incident. Firefighters are on the ready to move around the base and the Red Cross is the same. No matter what time you have to go help, Red Cross is there. We train with the Red Cross in many disasters. The professionals we have received from people that work for Red Cross and that bond with the Red Cross. It's quite amazing. They keep on well trained. And our people look to them for that type of expertise. That's hugely important to have people with expertise. If an organization like the Red Cross were there, 
there would be a great deal of chaos. Very close to moment faster. They can handle the warm water fly, or they can handle a plane crash in the Hudson, and certainly they can handle the devastation of your face together. So I'm around. And what we know from those responses is every disaster uh, to the people who are having it is like their 9 11. And we need to be there for them to meet whatever they're doing. And that's the fact that in this fourth Try to imagine losing uh, way along years and years and years of all around your clothes, your children's toys, things that you've had for years, and looking around and you have nothing, nothing left but the short out remains of your home. And think, what am I going to do? Where do I go from here? And to have somebody come and say, we'll help you out. Seeing the red cross there, it made me realize that we were there to help, but there was an outcome of that sort of You need someone who knows how to work with people psychologically and emotionally when they're in that really um, dicey period of time. It makes a difference. So when they were crossing from me at that moment, I said, well, you talk to me, and they told me to look at better. They told me that you must have lost everything. That you don't have to. That made me feel good. Emotionally, that made me feel good. Right, Christine, in this apartment, you are a good, hard shop, good, 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 The Bible is a Jewish to the Bible is a Jewish prayer. The Bible is a Jewish prayer. The Bible is as people with good heart, they don't they deny the prospect is something to exchange. I mean, how many people who get up and fail to go to the party? And they don't. And they went across the stairs and they went. Every day, the Red Cross responds to emergencies throughout greater New York, or even larger events outside of our city hurricanes, wildfires, and even that earthquake in Haiti. It's our level of preparedness that allows us and the American Red Cross to meet the needs of our communities. Whether it's a fire affecting two or three families or an event impacting hundreds, we are there to bring that up. The Red Cross was there as a mother to pass through the plane and the readiness to be there for all of us under 50 violence. This is truly incredible. So that talks a little bit about what we do. Um, and it, I mean, it shows a professionalism, it shows um, 
uh, and attentiveness. Uh, but kind of behind that, the reality is really this. Yeah, and some people type around our office say, you know, we help people kind of despite of ourselves sometimes. Uh, we are not really good at managing information and managing data. Uh, we are great when we get out to incident scenes and disasters, uh, but the way we do things sometimes, we, we kind of get in our get in our own way. Uh, and I wanted to kind of show you some examples of, of kind of how we're currently managing incidents and some of the kind of the challenges that that, that we face. So I said we go to 1,200 disasters a year. Every time we go to an incident, this is what we do. We create a Microsoft Word file called a Disaster Incident Worksheet. And this incident worksheet tracks everything that we do on the course of a disaster. Uh, information before we arrive, a sequence of events of what happens, and then a wrap-up of, of what we found when we got there and the type of assistance that we provided. So again, these are some of the photos of some of the uh, uh, aftermath of this incident. Overall, we create about 2,500 of these worksheets every year. And yes, every piece of data is locked in an individual document for each incident. But who kept the data in there? We have uh, dispatchers. Uh, like I mentioned before, 35 to 40 people who are working 24-7 who are entering that data for every incident. So, yeah, go ahead. We are specific. We actually are a little bit more sophisticated than other regions, surprisingly. So, and please interrupt me with any questions as, as we go. Um, I'm, you know, I'm happy to answer them. So, uh, we then take that information and again, it gets manually entered into a spreadsheet that records all of the incident data. So again, it's being typed here and retyped into a new log. Good. Dispatchers by phone. And then dispatchers are taking the information over the phone and then recording it. And then it's going into a spreadsheet, and then it's going into another system. Uh, you can see here we are up to incident number 1075. So our fiscal year started July 1, 2012. We've been to, to uh, 1,075 incidents as of this morning. So then our responders out in the field are filling out something called a 901. And this is the way the Red Cross has been doing things for years. This is a 901. So they fill out this form. I'm sure that some of you are probably too young to even know when we had carpets. Carpets. <laughs> okay. Then there are forms inside the form that get filled out. So, and this is the way the Red Cross does things. This is universal. So we had an incident in Aurora uh, about two or three weeks ago. Uh, we had 37 families displaced. We filled out 37 of these forms in one night to help those families. It's kind of a crazy way of doing this. We also have a system then called CAS, which is a national database system, which all of this information goes in. So the information from that form then gets taken and typed into CAS. So then now we have a record of all of this information. Uh, kind of supporting all this, there's a group called DST, uh, Disaster Services Technology. But their focus is really on kind of the big incident. And so what they do is they provide communications, they provide, uh, they provide computers and all that kind of stuff. But one of the things that the Red Cross really lacks is that internal uh, kind of that internal CTO, or the, the, the people who are kind of driving the technology kind of on the day-to-day -day, uh, stuff. All these solutions that you see are just by people who needed to solve a problem, and this is the best way that they can figure it out. The best way thing that they could come up with was just go to a Microsoft Word document and just start typing stuff in. I go around and I talk to all of my colleagues, and one of the first questions I ask them is I say, tell me about your spreadsheet. 
and they kind of look at me funny, and I was like, you know what I'm talking about, your spreadsheet, because everybody in the office has one that's theirs, and it's where they keep their data, and it's special and unique to them, uh, and if they lost it, they would be lost. Uh, and so all of this information is kind of in all in kind of all of these different places, and we have a really difficult time, you know, kind of using this, getting this data and using it in meaningful ways. So that said, I think that there are opportunities that we have started to see uh, in ways that we can we can kind of better manage all of this information. Uh, it started. I don't know how, how many of you were here last May for the uh, for the data dive. Anybody? Nobody? Wow. New people. New people. This is great. So last year we gave a bunch of incident data, uh, a year and a half worth of incident data, and just said, here you play with it. So we've got five years of incident data that we'd like to give to people. Just say, here's here's our here's our information for what we've done. Show us and tell us what you think you guys could do with this. Uh, so they developed this map that started to show us where where we were going to you know responses. Um, this is uh, the Roseland neighborhood. Uh, we went to 112 incidents there in in, uh, in a year and a half. Uh, and this is stuff that we all kind of knew anecdotally, but when finally somebody just does a very simple fusion table and puts it in a map, now we have something that we can actually start to work with. One of the other tools, and Derek is familiar with this tool that we've that we've found. It, it, one of the reasons why kind of starting to develop a, a relationship with the, with the tech community is we found a lot of these civic apps become become important to us in ways that you might not quite quite see. Uh, so the vacant building finder, if we have a fire and an incident, we can go onto Derek's map, type in the address, and find out ahead of time if the building's vacant. If the building's vacant, we're not necessarily going to need to send responders to take up the volunteers' time to go down to this fire uh, and provide services because we know the building's already vacant. So our apps like these that we've found become extremely helpful to us uh, in, in uh, determining whether we uh, actually go on responses. So we talked about kind of the data dive and some of the civic uh, technologies, as Chris has called them, that we've worked with. We've talked about some of the civic apps. A couple of the things that we're looking forward to uh, is working with our San Diego chapter who's developed what's called a common operating picture. And the idea of a common operating picture is to take all of your assets and bring all of those things together into one place so you can see what you're actually dealing with. Uh, so this is a technology that we're going to be bringing back and we're, we're looking for uh, looking for support. Uh, we're also starting to partner with other chapters like San Diego, Los Angeles, San Francisco. So we have opportunities for volunteers if you want to uh, not only work with the, with the Red Cross as a, as a local chapter, but to work with us as, as kind of a national organization, those opportunities are available. And ultimately what we're looking for are tools that help us tell our story. So any application uh, that we find that can tell where we can go to an alderman or we can go to a particular county and say, here's what the Red Cross has done in your community, uh, is something that's extremely beneficial. But we're not there yet. Uh, these are just kind of little things that we're, we're starting to see, things that are starting to become available to us. Uh, but we don't have, obviously, the capability in-house to do this. And so we're reaching out to groups like this to say, here are, some, here are some things that we think might be engaging, might be interesting, or you guys willing to help us out. Um, so in terms of kind of questions that you guys might have about how we operate, um, is there any kind of thing that, in terms of how we respond to disasters, big or large, any kind of questions that you guys have about what we do? So, Yep. Right. Who um, are the volunteers? How do they how do they come to you? How do you select who's going where? Um, so the way the way our volunteers come to us is 
a number of ways. It's a pretty wide demographic. We're a pretty young chapter as chapters go. Uh, typically, most chapters tend to be older, people who are retired. Uh, we tend to be more kind of a, a working chapter. So when we have large deployments, uh, we don't actually send a lot of people to Sandy or to, uh, to a Hurricane Katrina because everybody has jobs and they can't take the three weeks uh, that are needed to go through disaster. It's a fairly broad spectrum. Uh, it does not have, it's, it's not necessarily people who specialize in any kind of emergency management or emergency response. Uh, it's just something that they've that they decided to do. And most of our volunteers are engaged in a couple of different, a couple of different activities. So they might be disaster responders uh, and they put themselves on the schedule for six hours on a Saturday night and say, I'm available to go and, and help a family if needed. Uh, but they also may, uh, they may teach classes. Uh, for us as well, and they may do uh, they may make fundraising calls. So a, they do a whole variety of things. It's a really you know it's a pretty diverse diverse group. But again, one of the areas where we're really lacking is is people with with, with technological skills uh, because people don't we, we just haven't engaged that community. You talked a lot about uh, and how do you mobilize? So right now, and, and again, this gets back to kind of where 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 we have where we have technical deficiencies is we have a schedule, and the way we mobilize our volunteers is we pick up the phone and call them. Ideally, there would be you would like to see with, with the technology that's available that we could identify where there's an address, we know where our volunteers live, that there's a way that we could circle on a map a radius and say I want everybody notified within this radius that you know we need to go to an incident. Uh, but right now, it's pick up the phone, call the first person, call the second person, call the third person until you get enough people to go to the incident. So, yeah, is that a two-way practice? Typically, and then what will be fun is that there are a whole, there's a whole series of, of kind of potential triggers. That could mean that we may even need more volunteers. So we may get to an incident scene and find that there are 25, 30 people who are displaced by a fire. Uh, we may need to open a shelter uh, for for that large a population, which means we're calling in more volunteers. But again, it's it's a very kind of low tech system. Whereas if, if we had something where we were able to put rather than put this in the responders' hands, uh, that we're actually able to put technology in their hands where that they can start sending us this information back digitally. Now all of a sudden we have a two-way street between the dispatcher where they're communicating information much much quicker. Uh, the other thing is, is think, think in the winter time, if you're out filling seven or seven or eight of these out for a family that's sitting out in the cold waiting for you to get this paperwork done, when we have something where we can fill it out in maybe 15 minutes instead of getting them out of the cold and getting them to shelter much faster, uh, would certainly be you know, certainly a benefit to us. Uh, no, but that's certainly that's a, that's an area that our disaster services technology team would focus on, uh, and something that that, uh, that Christopher's talked about is is what happens when there's a large scale incident and infrastructure is is uh, it has broken down and needs to be repaired. Uh, it's not a particular expertise of ours. Uh, to, to, to make those kinds of repairs. Is that, is that where you're going with this? No, I'm actually, your question is more, so you still, let's say you have applications. Right. Is it something where you want the data to be broadcast and solid right away for backup, or do you want something where it's going to be locally stored and then eventually? I, I, think, that, I think that we'd be, we would be happy considering, you know, kind of either option or kind of a hybrid, uh, I think would, would, would make sense. Uh, one thing that I would love to be able to do is to take our data and make it available to the general public about where we respond and what we do, so that people can see live, real time. This is where the Red Cross is right now. All right, they're helping families here, helping families there. Uh, I mean, I always worry about you know what happens. You know, if you know if the cloud goes down, so to speak. Uh, you know, how would we how would we operate? Uh, but we have a very good low tech backup system that has been working for about 30 years. There, there's, it, it's, it's both. There are some things that are repetitive, uh, and some things that are very incident specific and very case specific, uh, specific, very specific to that family. 
you know, we might have a family, we may have an incident where there's a fatality, uh, and somebody's, you know, lost a family member, and so there may be information that's very specific to that particular incident. But most of the information is fairly repetitive, and it's stuff we already have in three or four places already, uh, because we've been documenting in the worksheets and spreadsheets and all these kinds of things. And why couldn't that simply be pushed out to, uh, to the responders as well? Uh, my kind of yeah, like, the question is like there are two ways to store the information you can do it in like you know it's a relational database, right? Or you can do it in something like the document database, right? But that just also affects how you sort of how you parse your information. And so the the thing about an app you can think about whether the information is coming from the end where this ready index is sorted out. I think it's going to be pulled together on the fly and it tends to be fairly unique per instance. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. Any other questions about kind of how we do, how we do what we do or how we don't do what we should be doing? So go ahead. Um, I've ever seen that national database. Isn't that, so you do everything three times then? Well, we actually, to take an incident from start to finish, we actually use 12 applications to get it from, from when we get and notified. Is the, that national one just not customizable enough to what you need? National, there's, we have, we have, we, we kind of speak about our relationship with our national office in kind of Star Wars terms, right, in that there's kind of the Empire and there are the Rebels, so. I work in the Union field, the yeah. same way. Yeah. So uh, I think that what we find is that uh, for this national database, uh, they won't even let us get close to writing an API to, uh, to send information, which we would love to be able to do. Yeah. We would love to be able to say, we have this information stored in a way that we can just send it straight on in uh, and populate it, but they're like. And that their database is set up that you can export your cell files and and, so. and they just give one person the password to catch all the stuff? There's probably about 10 of us who have access to putting to putting stuff in. Um, yeah, it's a very it's a very frustrating kind of time consuming system. And so I guess I, I'm not coming here to say, you know, here's the solution, somebody build us a solution. Uh, it's more to say, here's some of the challenges that we deal with. And we deal with these, they're dealing with these same challenges in Oklahoma right now. Because they're using that same 901, that same paperwork to write cases for people who are affected down there. So uh, what we're hoping, I think, as, as an organization is if we start partnering with other chapters uh, and start uh, you know, bringing more kind of smart people into our, into our organization, more you know, into the room, so to speak, uh, is that we start building tools that National can't really ignore just because they're just so good. I mean, one of the, one of the, one of the things we did during uh, the flooding here, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the folks over at Datascope. Uh, but they've got a food truck tracker. I don't know if you've ever seen that, that little app that they have. We sent out a bunch of emergency response vehicles with cleaning supplies uh, and cleanup kits and all kinds of stuff to help flood victims in Des Plaines, in Lyle, uh, Southern Cook County. And uh, so we went to our national office and said, hey, do you guys have a, 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 an app that can allow us to show where these trucks are? Uh, and uh, in just kind of a you know 1:30 in the morning kind of thought, I was like, you know what? What if we could take data scopes, food truck tracker, and just repurpose it for our herbs? And we'll actually tweet our locations out and put this on a map. And so we generated that in about four or five days. And it took it just took getting the right group of people together to put this thing together. And the national's like, hold on, we're developing the earth tracker. You guys are supposed to be doing that. And we're like, well, you know, we did, and it works, and it was put together in a very short amount of time. So. Um, so that's kind of the odd relationship that we have. We know we need to kind of amend it, uh, but we're not quite there yet. So, any other questions about kind of what we do or? So. Um, mostly, I mean, I'll be here. I'll be available just to kind of talk more about kind of you know kind of how we do things and what we're what we're looking for. Like I said, I don't want to come here and kind of dictate. Uh, you know, this is this is the problem that we have. Uh, or this is the you know this is the solution that we think we have in mind. It's just these are some of the challenges, uh, and I think there's a whole you know there's a whole really interesting variety of skill sets here, uh, and you know we would love to kind of engage you in a way that you know, we can create a meaningful project for you guys. So thank you very much. I really appreciate. It.